Good evening and welcome to the American University Museum. This talk is virtual, but from now until December 12th, you can actually walk into the museum to see these shows Friday, Saturday and Sundays, 11 to four without an appointment. So progress is being made. I'm so pleased to welcome Amber Robles Gordon and Larry Osai Mensa to talk about the exhibition Successions, Traversing US Colonialism and whatever else they want to talk about is fine with me. I know we're in for an exciting, interesting, provocative journey. Amber Robles Gordon was born in Puerto Rico, eventually making her way to Washington DC where she earned her MFA from Howard University. Her genre and medium define objects and installations in different spaces have been exhibited around the district and really throughout the world. I've admired her work for a decade. Larry Asai Mensa is a Ghanaian American curator and cultural critic born in the Bronx who has organized exhibitions and programs in commercial and nonprofit spaces around the world. Bringing Amber and Larry together in the American University Museum has sparked an important and memorable exhibition. The show is beautiful and powerful, and I hope you will come and experience their collaboration. I'm gonna turn it over to Larry and Amber. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, ja thank you Jack, much appreciated. Thank you um, for believing in the vision around the exhibition. Uh, thank you to the team at American University um, that's worked diligently despite the challenges of COVID to help see this show come to fruition. Um, and also obviously thank you to Amber um, for creating uh, a beautiful body of work um, that's really talking about some important topics, um, important ideas, um, and you know, I think an opportunity to showcase your talent in your hometown. You know, so uh, super excited. Um, just to give some folks some insight. Um, so it's a little after six. We're gonna chat for about forty minutes, and then uh, we'll begin to open it up for Q and A. There's a Q and A um, tab. Um, so if you want to just put your questions in the Q&A section, and uh, we will address them um, during that time. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we're looking forward to, you know, hearing your thoughts and feedback, you know, uh, from our conversation. And I think, you know, just to kind of start it off, um, Amber, for those who may or may not be familiar with your practice, um, how would you describe yourself, your identities? Um, your practice? Because I mean, I think this show is a, a beautiful metaphor of the layers that kind of not only encompass like who you are as a person and as an artist, but how we should be thinking about ourselves in these multiplicities, as opposed to kind of these binaries that we're conditioned to kind of think through. So how do I envision myself, my yeah. practice? How do you envision that... yourself, your identity and your practice? Got it. Um, so I consider myself an Afro-Latina, um, but I also uh, am of Caribbean and, and African descent. Um, and sometimes I do think that uh, like stating those in addition to uh, is important. Um, in some sense, I'm, you know, I'm still learning about or searching and, and uh, investigating what, uh, what else that means as an adult. Um, but yeah, in, in, in terms of self, that's what I consider myself. In addition, my artwork, I absolutely consider myself a mixed media artist. Sometimes that includes sculpture, installation, um, but it's really about the act of creating, um, the act of innovating, uh, materiality, um, cultivating. Those are the things that make me continue to strive um, for creating new things and also that help me live, um, that give me uh, energy. They always have been and I'm just grateful and just hope, claim that they always will. So Larry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, 
for the exhibition, we have quilts, we have uh, mixed media collage. Can you talk a little bit about the meaning of Succession's the actual title? Um, why was this the title that you chose to kind of encapsulate this, this exhibition and this body of work? So the word Successions has multiple meeting, meanings. Um, uh, an ecology, um, uh, geology, but the main meaning is the act of multiple things happening one after the other. Um, and multiple things existing one after the other. So what changes that um, in the like in, in geology or in ecology is either the shifting or changing, the growing, the adding of rocks or sediment, or um, something in relationship to an, um, an ecological environment. So shifting of water uh, and uh, earth um, or some sort of outside resource. And for me, oh, sorry, there's more to the more meanings. <laughs> I, I know I'm gonna sound like a nerd, but I love this word. Um, and also it talks about um, power. Like so the part of the meeting that talks about power is referring to um, succeeding into a position or a place um, of power. And I'm using it because of all of those meanings, of course, but because I want to see people uh, when I use the term people either of the global majority or people of the um, global majority, uh, I want to see us change the narrative about how we talk about ourselves, how we see ourselves, and then how we project, we act, we carry on. Um, that's the reason I, I chose this name. Um, beyond the rest of it, traversing U.S. colonialism, I it's important to keep on elevating this conversation about the treatment of people in, of color, period. And beyond talking about ecology, thinking about power and narrative, are there any other themes and concepts that you were thinking about as you were building out the show? Um, and I think it's also kind of important to highlight, you know, you made most of this work during COVID, you know, and how yeah. did that, kind of inform your approach. And then I think maybe we can go into a couple of works that are in the exhibition after you answer this question. Um, okay, wait, sorry. Repeat the question one more time. What are some additional themes that you were thinking about as you were putting together the show? Okay. And then how did COVID impact how you thought about these ideas and these themes with some of the work being made in Puerto Rico? you know, and, and you being on the ground in a place that wasn't well resourced during COVID. Okay. Ali, can you go to the slide that is uh, USVI political, please? That one, thank you. Okay, so one of the other um, important themes was about um, environmental racism and how mm. that affects um, the territories and the various ways that that affects the, the territories. So if, for example, in this image, um, if you look at what a Doppler, the image of a Doppler system and how it depicts the um, hur hurricanes, for example, this, these, these, uh, the quilts are modeled after Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria. And what happens is that you have the reds in the middle and then you have what I call like a gradation of a rainbow, rainbow gradation. So I elaborate on them within these quilts, but it's it's baby basically duplicated from that um, that system, and I've used them because of the tremendous impact that the environment and global global warming has had on the various islands. So for example, um, during the time period, one of the, the things that I use as an example is um, conversations with my grandmother. My grandmother lives in St. Thomas. And for as long as I've been having, you know, conversations with her about her life and the various things that have impacted her life, one of the things that she references is Hurricane Hugo. Um, and I believe that that was in the 80s. I want to say 80, 80 or 84. And it has always been a, a pivotal, pivotal point of where she talks about the impact of the environment on her, her actual 
individual life and the life of she in her society and, and on the island. Um, and never actually, with, I guess from my perspective, it seems like it's always had such a lasting impact. Um, and so for example, you know, speed forward to 2017, um, when all of the news and the impact of the, of the two hurricanes that were happening uh, in that area and, and impacting uh, Puerto Rico and St. Thomas, you know, and me sitting in, in the DC and, and watching some of the, the, just the poor reporting, uh, the imagery and the, uh, just, well, it, it made me so angry. It, it, it en enraged me in some sense. And I think that I harbored some of that. And I, I absolutely hope that some of that, that, that came out in these, this body of work. Um, so yeah, that is, that is absolutely one of the, the influencing factors or themes throughout the work. And can we um, go back to slide one and maybe talk about some of the works that are featured? So we have a selection of um, works just to give folks who are you know, here uh, witnessing this conversation um, an insight into just kind of the strategies and approaches and the different things that Amber was thinking about. Um, so I think one thing that's important to point out with the quilts, for example, is that you actually painted on both sides. Right, and so that the quilts are actually suspended in space within the gallery. Um, I, I guess, can you talk to us why that was important? That you know, you have this what you call the spiritual side and the political side um, of these works. Um, and maybe we can start with like DC political as as kind of like a jumping off point. Okay. Yeah. So um, all of the quilts, as, as Larry stated, have uh, double sided. Um, but they didn't start out that way. I, I started with um, dissecting the um, either the territory's seal or their their state flag, uh, and in doing so, I realized. Well, actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. We should probably back up um, because it's important to highlight that these um, the quilts signify the different territories. Oh, people may or may not know I guess that. we are. Yes, we, we're yeah, sorry. Sorry, guys, we're so used to that aspect. We're so used to talking to each yes. other that they're, they're <laughs> short hair. And I have to be conscious that, like, this is new information for a lot of people. Yeah. So, I guess if you can talk about the districts and the territories as well, is kind of another yeah. framework and why that was important. So, I think most people know that DC is a federal district, right? It's not a state. Um, and then you have other uh, territories like Puerto Rico, Guam, um, that that Northern Mariana highlight. Islands, American yeah, Samoa, so think, mm -hmm. and the USBI. So why was that important that we highlight these districts and these territories as part of this conversation specifically with the quilts? And then we can get into the actual quilts. OK, so. I'm trying, whenever I talk about this, I'm trying to start from the personal because whenever I don't, I get re redirected in some ways. So this for me was a, a journey of my, like healing my five-year-old self. It started off in, with a series called Place of Breath and Birth. And it was for me going back as a, an adult, grown adult, going back and saying, um, I, I need to have a relationship with my birthplace, which is Puerto Rico. Uh, so I had began to reach out to a number of people that I knew um, that lived there, uh, curators and, and writers and said, I, I need to find a way to be able to, um, to come to PR and create, be able to create in PR. Uh, and in doing so, um, fast forward um, through 2000, 2019 and 2020, I began to live there for a period of time and travel back and forth. So um, some of the, the future slides that we'll see are some of that work, but the quilts then became um, an extension because while I was studying about and, and being existing in PR, I realized that the, the, treat, the ill treatment was not just about Puerto Rico. It was also an extension about the US, the US territories. Um, and 
it was it just sad in the hell out of me. <laughs> and one of the things that we that I did was I came back to Larry and Jack and I said, look, I I need this um, both of these bodies of work to be shown in this in this exhibition, uh, and explain to them and some of the the the, um, the threads um, that go through both works. I hope that we'll be able to talk about those as well. Uh, anyway, they agreed. So. In doing so, um, now we come back to the, the duality of the quilts. I decided that I didn't just want to talk about or critique the, the, um, the US impact uh, on the territories. I needed to look at them, um, look at the, the works and the people as a whole, as beings, as, as just, deserving of wholeness and so what that meant for me was that I had to give them a form I had to give them a three-dimensional form and I had to make them the work sculptural so somewhere along I said look curators I need to be able to make this a double-sided work uh it's going to take me longer but please bear with me and you know see through and this why did you choose quilt quilting as a format quilting as a history um Particularly if you think about G's Vance quilts, um, why did you choose quilting this blanket, this format versus a canvas that we're kind of used to? Yeah. And then maybe if you want to talk about a lot of some of the um, signifiers within this piece in particular. Okay. So for me, working with fabric um, is like uh, referencing a second, the second skin, second by like the outward form of your existence when it comes to how we how we relate and and uh go about in society um and so uh by extension you know something that we cover our body and that we adorn ourselves and and also that we use as art um it, it just made sense to me um i've always preferred to work on fabric versus uh sometimes canvas um you know, and the majority of the works have some sort of circular uh, where the, the, the main or the featured form is inside circles. Uh, mm -hmm. Throughout my work, I believe in, in casting, whether it be spells or energy or, um, or even prayers. And in doing so through the research, I've done them through circles. Um, and this is, so it's like castings, spells, circles, um, or um, thoughts and visions, but also, it's also about the Doppler system. So these works are, you know, encased in um, the circle that reflects the Doppler system. Um, and then the third aspect, Crap, that just went right out of my head. I can't remember the third aspect that you go to uh, DC Spiritual. Next slide. Maybe that'll jog some of your memory. So we have this piece, DC uh, Spiritual Native American. This is the back of that piece. So I guess, can you talk to us to, in regard to what you were thinking about? Because it's obviously, you do have the, the consistency of that circular gesture, but then, you know, with the black ground, um, it's a different piece. And so, absolutely. you know, what was the strategy when you were approaching these and making them in the studio? Like, was it, did you, and I, and that, I, I know the answer to this question, but <laughs> what was this, <laughs> what was the strategy? What was the approach um, for you? Cause I know that there was sketching. I know there was like source images, Yeah. but you know, when you were in the studio and it's basically you and contending with this fabric, and having to make something, communicate something, like what was that like? Let me start by saying it, it is, a, although I've worked with fabric before, this was the first time that I had drawn on fabric because um, okay. the majority of the, this, this application is drawn. Um, okay. So all, all of the whites and the, and the blacks and the grays and the works that you'll be seeing are, are drawn. Um, because I love materiality and I, I needed, I needed these works to be, um, to be dense, but also very defined by the various mediums that I was working with. 
Um, and throughout my work, I, I work with black and white as um, like the yin and the yang as part of the balancing of the material and the energy that I'm putting into the work. Hmm. Um, but and what are some of the materials in this particular piece? So you have oil paint sticks, you have pastels, you have uh, actual pencil line, um, you know, you absolutely have uh, leather, um, then cotton, um, and then actual acrylic paint. And there's even house paint on, on there as well. Um, so one of the things that I tried to do in these works, when I began, you know, the research on the individual entities, um, because this one is, is composed of three, uh, um, looking at three different aspects or three different tribes that were um, like the indigenous people of the uh, uh, Washington DC area, uh, the, the, the tri-state area anyway. Um, and I, I've always had like appropriation is something that I just don't want to be a part of. It's not <laughs> my intention at all. So I decided that I, I did not want to um, take individual cultural aspects of each territory and place them into the work. I, there are things that I that I've used to be similar to or like uh, reminiscent of, but in general, what I tried to do was to stay abstract. Um, mm. And why, try and, and and can you dig? Sorry, can you dig a little bit deeper into like why abstraction as like your device, particularly given the history of abstraction in Washington, in the DMV? Well, yeah, I, I guess it, it, it is my place of, <laughs> it's my place of comfort to some degree. Mm. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, seeing uh, geez bang quilts and um, Guatemalan artwork and um, um, various um, like Barbara Cole, if anybody remembers Barbara Cole's uh, quilts. Um, they were like staples in relationship to the cultural expo things that I was exposed to within my home and 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 then extension of my culture. Um, so that was extremely important. And so ge um, geometrical uh, symmetry and um, uh, sacred geometry have always just been something that I literally when I pick up a sketch pad and, and pen and pencil, that's what I go to first. Also, I wanted to keep the fundamental, the foundation of the work um, accessible universally. I, I, I wanted to keep it in abstraction. Uh, and this was my way to do so. Now, the funny thing about the universe is that every damn thing is connected. So if you put a series of shapes together, you're going to get some type of figure, some type of reference mm -hmm. point. So if we could go to the, um, to uh, Ali, if we can go to the USVI spiritual. That's Next slide yes. five. So for some reason, I don't know that you that can make this up, but so th this is um, the spiritual USVI. And um, this is the title is Mokujumbi, Walk Tall and Heal Forward. So I was probably halfway through this and already the Mokujumbi was already kind of staring back at me. Um, and my mother came in, uh, Rafael came in and we, they were all like, okay, you see that, right? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so this was the first um, in the series because I'd worked on the political first this mm -hmm. was the actual first uh, spiritual side that was actually completed. Uh, and then the one before that was the second. So um, if any, you know anything about the um, Caribbean culture, because USVI is uh, St. John, St. Croix and St. Thomas and carnival is a very intricate and essential part of, of uh, the, the tradition. Um, and the Mokujumbi is the one that walks on the stilts and is, is um, is a prominent aspect of the the carnival, the the parades that go on, uh, and it's um, it's a character that was uh, part of East uh, Central Africa, and came about. Um, the tradition is it's like it's a god uh, and the healer. Um, and the fact that it came through in the imagery and I was able to identify it, I, I thought was phenomenal. 
Um, yeah. Um, can we go to next slide? Uh, my Spanish is not that good, but the eternal <laughs> altar for women forsaken and souls relinquished, yet the choice must always remain hers. So this is one of the mixed media collages on Canvas. So could you talk to us a little bit about this and what's the, how is this process different from working with the fabrics? Sure. So um, there are 10 in this series and these are really layered. They were much more, in some sense, more intense than the larger works to some degree. I know that sounds weird, but they absolutely were. Um, and if we can go really quick, can you, Ali, can you go to the uh, sketches while I was in PR? They should be some of the last series, last images. Number, number nine. Yeah. Right there. Thank you. While I was in PR, one of my um, promises to myself was that I was going to sketch every day. And so these are some of the sketches that I did uh, while there. Um, and eventually, when I, when I started to work on the Place of Breath and Birth series, I began to cut them out, cut them out, uh, uh, copy them, um, and literally build up with them. If we can go back to the, um, thank you. So that image on the far right, the sketch on the far right is what I literally built up the town or the stru structure, the foundation, the middle uh, of this work. And through my research, I was um, exposed to some of the, the just horrible treatment of, of Puerto Rican women and men actually um, that were done you know, for the sake of uh, birth control. And this set me down a very interesting path in my own personal um, experiences because I absolutely think that birth control is, is, is a right of every woman. Um, and whether it's this is your measure or, or other methods um, that is on you, but it, the choice should always remain uh, in the woman's hands. Um, but it was just horrible to hear some of the things that, um, that doctors from the US came to PR um, and imposed forced um, on Puerto Rican women and students at that, um, students and held their, and, and somehow they were in a relationship where they held the people's, their grades um, from them if they were not participating, fully participating in, in these, uh, these experimentations. So once I, I realized that um, this was what came of that, um, that knowledge for me. And actually this is the very last in that series and it was the hardest one. There, there was a point when I was like, damn it, maybe this work is not gonna get done. Um, but long last, I was able to complete it. And then we have, uh, the next slide. And then also, could you talk about why it was important, you know, to the best of our ability to kind of acknowledge, you know, the bilingual, your bilingual, like, culture, right? And so not just for the works to be titled in Spanish, but also in English. Um, we made an effort to do that on the website, the exhibition website. But why was that important for you? Because you, you talked earlier about, like, healing your five-year-old self and, and this research and finding, maybe, you know, filling in these kind of gaps yeah. culturally that may, may, may have uh, made itself known as you've gotten older. So, um, you know, as a five-year-old, I, I lived, uh, we lived in, um, uh, Arlington, Virginia, and I, the school that I went to in the neighborhood was predominantly white, and I remember being teased as a child um, and coming home one day and deciding that I, I didn't want to speak Spanish anymore, um, and it's something that I, I regret, I've regretted since grade school, um, and it's always impacted who I believed myself to be as a Latina, because without 
there are there are people that think that without the language that you are not uh, that you cannot be considered Latina. In fact, there's people that, that think even if you have the language that if you're of, of a colored hue to a certain degree that you look as as brown as I do that you couldn't possibly be Latina. Um, and then on the other side of that, you have uh, white Americans that have challenged um, and, and have continued to challenge your ethnicity, your race, um, who you claim yourself to be. So it was absolutely important for me to uh, name these works in Spanish and in English um, because I wanted it to be readily available for anybody and everybody who who um, who wanted to identify with the work um, that was that was absolutely important and you know and the other thing about language uh, one of the things that when I went first with my mother to, to Puerto Rico um, and we had the extended first extended um, residency there seeing um, Puerto Rico through my mother's eyes was so um, it was so enlivening um, and it was something that I, I, I didn't get from the rest of my family. So it was important for not only the language, but also for uh, visually for people to be able to, uh, to feel that. And I, I hope that comes through in the works because I absolutely mm. feel it. Mm. And can you talk a little bit about this piece? Um, you have the figure, you have, um, signifies towards fruit. Um, and then you also um, divide the picture plane into these, you know, almost these three segments. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, this one is called Closed Lines Community and, and, and Eternal Energy. And um, one of the things that was also impacted the this series was where we were living in PR and uh, it was on a third level of, of uh, the apartment building and you can literally see about three or four miles out and uh, one of what I would consider like the luxuries the privileges of being where we were in PR was that you can see the transition from um, throughout the day in my studio and home uh, and uh, I wanted to give um, the works this type of atmospheric environment so you could possibly get an inkling of what that transition felt like. Um, and uh, so that's why the, the work is divided. The other, the other thing is um, one of the things that um, the actual, um, what's it called, the rubber tree Mm -hmm. On the Sagrada de Corazón um, Sacred Heart University's uh, campus, they have this the, the have a, a arboretum throughout the campus, and one of the first trees that I interacted was the rubber tree. And so, <laughs> not knowing, but it 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 literally impacted all of the works that I ended up creating in the last two two years, because that abstraction abstracted. Um, forms that come up in the actual sketches and in this work they start at the bottom they come to the center of the work and then they move up the top of the the middle of the work and then up out to the sides to the to the ceiling or to the the ends of the canvas um because those are on canvas that we're looking at right now mm -hmm. and they they became this like foundation so it's also a banyan tree so what I love about this tree is that it not only do its roots lit, they, like there's so many of them and they look like they're all the way through the tree, but it, it hosts other uh, ecological environments within the tree. Um, and so that's what I tried to relay uh, in this, in this, uh, these works. And the, the banyan tree, the rubber tree uh, is not only in this works, it's also within the larger quilts which I think is very, um, it just made sense in relationship to how PR was the impetus of this conversation period for me uh, in relationship to then further the larger works about the US territories. Hmm. Uh, I wanna go through a couple more slides and then I wanna address a couple more questions before we open up the Q&A. 
Um, and so can we go to the next slide, botanical of love, self-reflection and spirituality? So can you talk a little bit about this? You see that kind of totemic structure. This looks like it's divided into four parts, but then you have what looks like to be one or two figures in there, as, as well as like landscape. You see what looks like pyramids or could be mountains. It's kind of gesture towards the celestial in the second, yeah. I guess, kind of section of this. Yeah. And then even at the top of this, what I look at as a totem is like an individual with some type of headdress. Mm -hmm. That's actually Janet Jackson. <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. I went back a little bit in my own, you know, <laughs> I guess childhood experience of our favoring uh, Janet Jackson. But this work is it's actually really personal. But um, so the Botanica is, you know, a, it's a cultural um, icon in, in Puerto Rican and even Caribbean um, uh, history and, um, and even current existence. Um, it's where you get your, to some degree, your love potions and your healing, healing uh, powders and, and spices. And um, so it's this range of like uh, health and healing but also love and health and, and, and community. Um, and I made it my business to, to track down various ones throughout PR. And so it was easy for me to reference it um, within this work. And the imagery that you're looking at, the, the imagery of um, uh, fi the figuration in this, uh, it's actually mm -hmm. pictures of me. And one is of me probably about four or five years ago. And the other is, is uh, a picture of me when I was 18. So because this was like a returning and, and, and a personal journey, um, it, it's almost like a, um, a statement about the growth that I was able to, and the path that I was able to um, not necessarily end, but an ending and a beginning all in one with this trip and with this, um, this work. But yes, it absolutely has uh, three or four planes within it. Um, and, you know, a lot of my work is about spiritual journeys um, and, mm -hmm. and referencing uh, and like mysticism to some degree. Some of the things that I believe that, that um, this world, for me, that I've had to create about my own, my either myself and my life um, in order to deal with some of the, the, the various BS in this world um, and to think of other places where my either my soul has been or that I want it to become or exist in some days in the future um, because sometimes this world is not enough mm -hmm. so I, I feel like I literally have to create beyond it because not only you know am I worthy of it but other people that see themselves in my brownness and the imagery, I, I want them to know that they are worthy of it. Mm -hmm. Can we um, go to slide 10 and then we can um, unshare the, the deck. And so these are in reference images. So that's the tree that you were talking about. Can you yeah. talk a little bit more about these images and, 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 and what did you pull? How did it inform like textures or ideas? Um, so of course there's a, you know, a lot of greenery throughout, um, PR and there's one of, um, my, between my mother and I, one of our goals to, to just truly explore some of the greenery that was there, but these, the top two images, um, are, uh, taken while on walks, uh, throughout the Puerto Nuevo, um, neighborhood that we were uh, staying in, um, and, you know, there was always imagery of the Virgin Mary throughout neighborhoods um, and throughout the ch church at Sagrada de Corazón. And, and that imagery actually um, eventually Im was um, affected and, and I put it into some of the works um, in the further conversation about uh, to some degree colonialism and mm. um, uh, colorism uh, throughout some of the other the other uh, places place of breath and birth collages but yes the bottom left is um, the banyan tree again uh, or the rubber tree 
Um, the one, the image to the right of it is another image from the, um, the Botanica. Um, and the one on the right is of me while we were seeing some of the various murals. So one of the things that also surprised me about uh, Puerto Rico was the extensive murals that the island has. There were mm. whole neighborhoods that were impacted and, um, and enriched by the various uh, types of either tagging um, and there was a full spectrum of like tagging all the way through to various murals. Um, uh, I was really, really taken back by um, that full array of murals that I was that we took in while we were there. Mm. And this, uh, that was this okay. is all part of the reference wall. Um, okay. I've always thought that. And that's a reference wall that's in the exhibition. We, we, we yeah. don't have an image. Yeah. But those who come to see the show will be surprised and delighted. Yeah. We can't show you everything. So we have to give you a reason <laughs> to see the show. Yeah. And I've always thought that it, it like when I, as a purveyor of, of artwork and, you know, museums and galleries, I've always loved to see reference material. So I wanted to make sure that I that my exhibit in case it uh, featured reference material. Um, it's like, it's like showing uh, data points in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to add, we, we can um, unshare the slides now. I wanted to ask you, you talked about abstraction as a device to make the work feel accessible. Um, can you talk about how you balance abstraction with storytelling or na building narrative and, and, and through the work? Yeah, I remember in one of the talks or one of our conversations, you and I, I've, I've talked about how abstraction is sometimes hard for me to explain because it comes, it, it feels like a, um, like a, like something that I shouldn't have to explain. Like, for example, I shouldn't mm -hmm. have to explain my blackness or shouldn't have to explain uh, being Caribbean. Um, and I, that might not make sense to everybody else, but, so I, the way that I break down abstraction or, or building or even creating is in layers. Um, so for example, in, when it comes to the quilts, um, if you, we had to, uh, we had to do la um, a layer, a border on the quilt. So each quilt has the acrylic and paint, the, the house paint um, border. And then you have um, where I am doing the mark making, the line making, which is the whites, the grays, the, the um, and some on the white base, it's the blacks and grays. Uh, and then you have um, the circular um, encasements. <laughs> I'm literally going through <laughs> the order in which we did each quilt and the circles, the gold, um, the gold circled in the blacks and whites, um, and then uh, the variations of the the circular gradation and the breakdown of the um, of the the uh, seal or the flag. Um, so I, the way I break down abstraction is through layers, layers, okay. density, materiality. Um, it's, it's how I formulate, um, like questions and answers. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, um, Afro-Latinidad has become a more accepted and talked about, um, you know, what does Afro-Latinidad mean to you and why is it important to recognize that? Um, cause you've talked about, you know, making sure it's clear that you are, recognized as a Latina, as a, a Black woman, a Caribbean woman. So why is it important that that all is kind of encapsulated and, and, and there's discourse around it? Yeah. So um, I think for me, it, it comes back to, again, a personal narrative, because when growing up in a Arlington County school system, there were parts of you that I, I, I couldn't or didn't choose to um, to unveil, to uh, share with people because of some of the, the bias that was there um, and just lack of knowledge when it came to the, the, the extent 
aspect of what uh, ethnicity and race and culture could mean for an individual. Um, and plus, you know, in grade school, high school, you are literally trying to just exist and get a good grade and, and have friends and some of those things um, you're not thinking about culture and ethnicity and, and identity in that way. Um, so as an adult, you know, and being able to continue to cultivate and create work and, and um, what I hope is also an extension of, you know, in some ways helping others to see themselves, reflect themselves as I see it in my own work. Now I have a choice. Mm -hmm. Now I have the ability now I, I, I know how important it is to claim and identify and name oneself. Um, mm. And then, you know, almost like the, um, the humbleness to know that I still have so much to learn mm -hmm. and that I'm willing and able and, you know, I'm learning that every day, so. And how would you say your work um, references, because there's a lot of research that goes into you, you, know, you making these works. How does your work reference Afro-Caribbean, women of Afro-Caribbean descent? Are there particular um, individuals that you thought about? You know, obviously your mother uh, was yeah. one um, influence and your grandmother. Are there other individuals, whether it's family or I guess kind of luminaries um, that you thought about? Maybe it's in the work kind of like there or maybe it's like a subcontext. Hmm. Um, hmm. You know, definitely um, in relation to my, my own mother and, and, and the stories that I relay when I'm talking about the work. I think, okay, so what comes to mind is, uh, you know, my, my um, parents separated in uh, when I was 12. And so I had this, and my family is consisted here of my brother, my, my mother, and myself. Um, and, you know, the rest of my family was either in St. Thomas, um, uh, Antigua, St. John, some parts of the South and PR. So my mother made sure that we had this um, like circle of Latina and, and African-American um, people and, um, and a good, if not the majority of them were, were women. Um, and they were women throughout, you know, fields and, and stratas of life. Um, and they gave me power and empowerment because um, through just being, through just existing. For an example, like my godmother, my my godmother, even when I could not, as I as I began to do, you know, better and more successful in life, um, and there were things that I missed out on, but they were still my godmother was still the person that would say, no, you have a different path. Um, and just because you can't be here for, you know, this birthday or this event um, does not mean we don't know that, we're, that, that you love us, you know? Mm. And I guess that make, it's making me like this, feel sappy right now because my, grand, my godmother recently passed. But those women, whether they know it or not, I, I feel like they're all through my work. Mm. Um, they're... they're absolute intricate parts of my work. Uh, two more questions and then I'll go to the Q&A. So if you have questions, please put it in there. We already have a couple of really great ones. Um, artistic influences, who are some of your artistic influences? Um, hmm. uh, so there's always Alma Thomas. I love Alma hmm. Thomas. Why um, do you love Alma Thomas? Because her relationship to color, like mm. color and and and, and um, uh, primary colors, um, uh, we call that ab abstraction, and brush strokes. Like she made life out of just three elements. You know, life mm -hmm. emerged from a canvas out of three elements, and she did it. You know, in in, in her own time. 
um, I, I just, to me, that was always amazing. Um, and one more. Ah. Influence. <laughs> You've named a lot of people to me in the past, so. Well, there's, one, one okay. person. so for example, there's, um, what comes to mind is Jack Whitten. Is that, okay. that his last name? But also Sam yep. Gilliam. Um, mm -hmm. I love Martha Jackson Jarvis's work. Okay. Um, why, why, why with Martha? So, oh my God, I can't remember the name of this series, but I love when Martha, when Martha dabbles with um, density and materials on paper or on okay. canvas, like she makes things come alive um, mm -hmm. and take on new roles, you know, uh, when it comes to materiality, she's like, she just, she's a boss at it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And my last question, then I'll get into the Q and A's. As someone who's lived in the DMV for almost two decades, I think. Yeah. Um, how special and important is it to have this exhibition at AU and and your family and friends to see your work within an institutional capacity, which I think is very different than like a commercial gallery. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, so for example, my mom um, is an alumni of, of AU. Um, okay. So but it's, it's absolutely important. Um, but also I think one of the things that makes it very um, a touching to me is that like, for example, I've known Jack for um, a very long time and um, being able to have this exhibit in this way and, and also the message that I'm trying to convey. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, I don't, I don't know that I have a word for it, but it, it absolutely is meaningful. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, so I'm gonna get to some of the questions. We have one from Laura. Can you talk about how you, per you perceive colorism in PR versus the United States? Ooh. <laughs> um, so color is what I've noticed is that colorism in PR is it's um, it's more accepted it's more challenge it's not it's unchallenged to some degree um, what I've seen is that there are a lot more groups of people um, specifically uh, people that have more melanin that are challenging some of those norms um, but it absolutely, it ex exists and it's, it's very much what I would say ignored in some of, some of uh, the areas. Um, and it seems that it's more of a, a, a very, a strata thing, a class thing, um, but it absolutely exists. And how do you think it differs from, the, I guess, what we deal with here in the United States, besides class? Is it is it less in your face, or is it something that people kind of like grin and bear it? I think it or depends on who not... you're speaking to. Okay. Um. So it, with PR, it is it's more it's more within the actual culture. Um. It's it's, mm. it's accepted. Like you you know they, they call people Mar Morena, um. And I was just mm -hmm. to wonder like in some of my mother's interactions with some of her friends, um. Uh, and, it, and it it absolutely shows the difference between her her upbringing and mine, where if you called me Morena and, and, and which is either brown or black, um, in English. I, I would see that differently, mm -hmm. but within um, that culture, it, it, it's more of an, a term of endearment or it can be considered a term of endearment. Now, the problem that I've seen is that some of, some of the treatment after the name is what's problematic and yeah. that they don't realize that calling somebody that when they're in agreement with it is one thing when they see it as a term of endearment but when some of the practices that are that are are, are lined underneath that um, are not conducive to a person's to a person's well-being then that's problematic yeah. whereas yeah. in the states i think um that more people are aware of, of racism and, and colorism um that they're uh more more 
able and willing to speak up and say, eh, yeah. that's not going to cut it. Um, or what did you mean by that? Or I prefer that you not call me that. There's, there's, a, t there's a total difference. It's almost like a veil. And some of that has to do with the actual governing of Puerto Rico. It was very, uh, there was a governor um, who, I can't remember his name, but who, who made his business to change the way that colorism was, um, uh, was seen in um, PR. But unfortunately, it was like he, he kind of uh, tucked it under the rug to some degree, and it became a cultural thing to ignore people's color but you mm. cannot ignore people's color because globe racism is a globe or or um oh, what is the term anti-blackness is global mm -hmm. but anything you try to do without uh, above or over anti-blackness over white supremacism without acknowledging those two things it's unfortunately it's a veil it's a cover it's a it's a mm. farce because you have mm. not addressed the underlying uh, like ailment of our world, mm. which is mm. focused on to people of color. Mm. Mm. And, it, and if not people of color, then it's people of a certain class. We, we have a question from Juliet. Um, how does this work uh, in this exhibition relate to your previous work? And where do you see yourself going in terms of other themes you would like to explore? Hmm. Mm -mm. Um, so I absolutely think that this work was was very, you know, what I would consider personal. And although there are other personal threads throughout the majority of my work, I definitely think that this was um, a departure in some sense. Um, but I find that my work falls into like almost like three categories. One that is is focusing on color, um, and and the uh, and materiality, um, and then there is the lines where I'm I'm looking at my own personal growth, um, mm -hmm. and I tend to then uh, try and put that on a micro macro, and so it's it's not just about my growth; it's about how society looks at whatever issue I'm looking at. Um, so it, my work tends to fall in those two categories. Um, well, now that the show is up, I mean, and you've seen the work in space, I mean, are there, are there new things that you're thinking about or things that you want to explore in your next body of work that's revealed itself to you or new questions? It's usually issues that um, that trigger me. So for example, one of the things that um, has been on my mind is, you know, the overall treatment of women um, when it comes to the amount of women that have been, um, what's the word, the, the amount of missing women in the world, okay. period. Um, and then when you look at the numbers, there's, when it comes to Indigenous and women of color, the amount, the, the numbers are so extremely high. And then there's the, there is a, an, an appropriate number of, of that are not missing and that they're not getting the amount of coverage, um, media coverage in order to find and resources in order to find and, and do something about this, um, this pattern. Uh, so that's one of the things that hurts my head. <laughs> Uh, two more questions, um, if, if that's possible, Jack, really quickly. Okay. Uh, um, from TMC, did you or your, your family or any of the research um, bring up the conversation around the U.S. military experience or interaction in some of the ter territories you depicted? Did that Wait, ever come sorry, up? Sorry, you, you kind of went out. I didn't hear the first part of that question. Did the U.S. military experience or interaction in these territories ever come up in your research or conversations with family or, or other folks? Absolutely. So the U.S. has over 800 um, different U uh, bases around the world. Some of the, the actual atolls 
um, uh, uh, that are owned, that were annexed by uh, the U.S., have more uh, sovereignty than the than the damn uh, territories. Literally, um, there's all sorts of little facts that I that uh, that were that I've through the research that um, uh, that came out, and some of the things, the experimentations, and the the. Well, the things that the U.S. government did were so heart-wrenching um, in mm. order to annex some of these islands. Um, and then this is part of the problem. So they did all these things to annex these islands and, and to, to get ownership of them. And then they didn't, re they didn't know or care or, or do the work to follow up to even figure out how to continue to govern. Mm. Um, and that's part of the problem. That's part of the reason why you know, um, that some of the islands are not prepared for the, uh, the um, impact of global warming and hurricanes and uh, typhoons. And um, some of the infrastructure is not in place still. Uh, there there are, are some of the, the um, like um, American Samoa and, and Northern Mariana Islands, um, they, they still have impact from some of the, the past typhoons that have hit their um, islands. There's a whole range of things um, that were started by the U.S. government and army, um, and that, but then have not been followed through uh, in relationship to the ongoing and continuous management of, or, you know, management is not necessarily the right word, but of the territory. So I absolutely have, there's a tremendous amount of things. And last question from John, just to piggyback what you just mentioned, how can, what can artists do, you know, to help navigate a lot of the challenges that these different territories have to deal with, you know, whether it's through their practice, whether it's through archiving, whether it's continuing to like highlight and celebrate the various cultures, what do you think some things that artists can do, you know, to respond to, you know, what you've kind of ignited through this exhibition? Well, I think you mentioned um, part of them in your in the question uh, in relation to archiving and um, and documenting. So the thing is, um, and I don't know who's asking the question. So I, I think this was John. Gap no, no, no I don't. I don't want to know. Meaning, um, I'll tell you why in a minute. <laughs> okay. Because I think you got to be very careful with your intention and your execution. So for example, um, you don't want to document someone that does not want to be documented. You don't want to document a, a, a group or a people that do not want to be, to be photographed, do not want to, you have to make sure that your intention matches your, your actual execution uh, and actions and that the people that are there are welcoming of this interaction, this, this dialogue, this, um, it's essential that you build, um, you build community, you build relationships, you build bridges um, and you live on them, you exist on them, you stand by them, um, else you, you can literally create more havoc than you're trying to affect. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I think with that, uh, thank you, Amber. Thank you for your time and your thank candor you. and, and sharing insights. Uh, I will turn it over back to Jack. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for your questions as well. Well, Amber and, and Larry, I just want to, you know, I mean, what a what a beautiful multi-layered conversation. I could see it was just getting warmed up. Could go on for a long time. Uh, but I'm, I'm very grateful. And I just want to encourage everybody to come down to the museum because this is uh, an ex quite an experience to see this show, to come down and see it in the round. I mean, it's uh, wonderful to talk about the ideas and uh, you know, symbolism and history, but uh, it's also an experience that uh, really can't be duplicated. So uh, thank you both for a great program and uh, come on down everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>